Afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for coming this afternoon. I must admit, I'm flagging a little, finally, but uh, hopefully get through this. It's all these great lunches. Is the food good, or is it just me? Uh, um, so, as I say, we'd like to talk about um, the ABC learning design method and also this thing I call the app methodology. It's a bit of a double act, so I'm going to just intro. I'm going to pass over to Clive in a second. Just to say what I am, so I'm a faculty learning technology lead. Now, I was only joined UCL two years ago uh, as part of a COVID response. Um, so we were, 10 of us are brought into every faculty, one in each faculty to lead. And, and what our role was is primarily to work with academics and departments. Um, and I'm an ex-science teacher and stuff, so I work for mathematics and physical sciences. I have a natural fit in there. Um, and so I can help tailor the stuff on the ground um, that we need to do with what we're trying to, with what we did education offer and, and provide. And I have to work very much across different areas. So I work with ARENA, which is Clive's area, which is an academic development unit. I work with ISD, I work with digital education, but primarily work with academics. Um, so it's my role to work out exactly the best way to use a technology like Moodle and the Moodle activities and resources in a specific context. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Forden's theory and, and the app methodology in a bit, but first off, I'm going to pass over to Clive. We'll talk about the ABC learning design method and, and what that is. Okay. Right, okay then. Well, thank you very much, Rich. Um, okay, so thanks everyone who's staying uh, to this sort of like last uh, parallel session. Uh, and as a reward, we're going to show you not one but two different methodologies which are going to help the design of your courses and make them so much better. Um, so the two are ABC... And APT. So Rich is going to talk about, which is broken. Uh, Rich is going to talk about uh, APT, and I'm going to talk about uh, ABC. Has anyone heard of ABC before? Oh my goodness! Well, that's really nice. So um, ABC is a, oh, um, yeah, come on. Oh, I can move around. Oh, I have, I have uh, freedom now to move around. Okay. So um, ABC is a method that we uh, developed in, uh, in UCL about five or six years ago, and it's really taken off really well. We've used a lot in. Uh, in, in UCL, but also um, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's gone viral, that would be an exaggeration, but it's been quite popular in other universities around the UK, around Europe, research universities, colleges, schools, and so on. Um, and um, the, if you don't know anything about it, it's, uh, it's based around a workshop. So what we do is we bring academic colleagues, teachers, and whatnot, we bring them around a table, and we get them to design their courses. Oh, sorry, hello. Uh, we get them to design their courses and their modules as a group. Okay, so the whole point of it really is to get teachers to speak into teachers. Uh, and we use the, the workshop, I'll show you how the workshop works in a second. But the most important thing is, it's this idea of people working together creatively uh, and discussing things and discussing their teaching. It's something that teachers don't probably do enough of, of. And we can get people in and they work around a program or a module or a course. And they would do it really quickly, do it about 90, 90 minutes maximum. Sometimes you can do it quickly. Uh, so we use it for modules for courses, for MOOCs, for non-credit bearing courses, and so on. Uh, the, it's been really successful, I think partly because it's based on a theory. Um, Rich will talk a little bit more about it. One of our lecturers, uh, one of our professors, uh, Professor Diana Lorillard from the Institute of Education in uh, UCL, she has the uh, conversational theory, which we'll explain in a second. So I think part of the power of it, it's very, very simple, but behind it, it's this kind of theoretical approach which uh, makes it uh, much more robust. Just got right on thing here. Uh, I think that's all I wanted to say there. Um, so it's taken off, and I think for, for two reasons. One, it works. Okay, so almost everybody, everybody, most people, uh, have used it. It, it kind of works it for engaging the academics, get them to have this pedagogical conversation, to have a proper design. Okay, so um, we for in UCL, we're a we're a big Moodle user. We've got about fifty thousand students who've been using Moodle for a decade, probably more. But if you look in our courses, you know, our Moodle courses, a lot of them are fairly kind of dull, you know, lists of, you know, lists of files and stuff like that. We're getting better, folks. We use templates and checklists and stuff like that, but it's still quite a lot in there. So what we're trying to do is think about more about uh, activating learning. So it becomes a more active, uh, the students are more actively engaged with Moodle and, and with the VLE. So kind of everybody wants to do that. So we've got this method of really helping people to think about that. Um, and it's kind of spread around various parts of the world. Um, so, as I say, it works. But the other thing is it's free. You know? So, well, I think that's a great part of its popularity. You can go down to this, on these little cards, if you've got a card. It's a URL, you can go in there, you can download stuff. We've got about 15 different languages. Uh, there's videos, you can watch me and my colleagues sort of talking about how it works. And uh, so you could, you know, go back to the office tomorrow, and then Tuesday you could run a workshop if you want. Uh, but get back in contact with us uh, if you do so. And if you want to do another translation, likewise. 
Um, so this is a theory. So when we're working with our colleagues, academic colleagues, we don't talk about theory. I mean, we're not going to do that, obviously. That would scare them. Uh, but what Diana did was uh, she kind of mapped out this sort of adult learning and uh, as a sort of ginormous conversation. Uh, but she identified these six types of learning that um, are embedded in that. So there's acquiring, which is where the students kind of read stuff and look at videos and all that sort of thing. Inquiring, which is like when the students are researchers. They're researching into the domain. So they're looking at data, documents, designs, all that sort of stuff. Producing is what they produce for, mostly for teachers, to be honest, for assessment. You know, they're producing, they're articulating their knowledge. Practicing is where they learn how to do the discipline. So that could be field work and clinical work or uh, teaching or whatever you're doing as, as part of a discipline. Uh, you're working with that and you get some feedback from your teachers. Uh, discussing and collaboration are the kind of group aspects of it. Discussion is articulating your ideas in a group and collaborating is working together as a, working together as a, uh, for, for a common task. So if we think there's a, there's a lovely teacher, there's a lovely student, and there's all the students working together. So it's three things coming uh, together. So it's a very simple model. Um, but what we do is we, we get people to design courses using, this is originally face-to-face, -face, uh, using these card sets. So I've handed out little cards. Oh, last one's gone. Can you imagine the little cards you've got? Uh, each card represents one of the learning types. And what people do is you use that like a little Lego, a little set of Lego to build up this learner journey through their courses. Okay? Uh, teachers really get to it really quickly. It's not really a bit of a problem. Uh, you get this design and then you think about where's our assessment going to be, where's the uh, feedback going to be. So um, it gets, uh, as I say, it gets a kind of discussion going about what's the student journey through there. And you can think of these uh, learning types as different types of engagement with students in order to get through the course and reach the learning outcomes. So uh, the product is a design. Normally the designs are quite linear. Um, you know, things you've been doing the first week, second week, but some really nice ones as well. This is, this is one, a circular design, sort of spiral curriculum type thing, where the students go through <laughs> several times through a curriculum cycle. Okay? And each time they're using each of these things, some uh, collaboration there, there's some discussion going there, and down here's the production that they're producing something for assessment. Uh, so uh, part of the exercise on the face-to-face on the -face one, anyway, is we do, um, they can go and turn over the card, and if you've got one of the cards, you can turn over, um, and you'll see there's various activities, and the teachers then identify which activities they're going to do. So these are quite generic. Uh, ABC was, it's not Moodle-specific. We do have a Moodle-specific version, but it's quite generic. Um, but it sort of like identifies what type of learning, um, act, <coughs> what type of activities uh, you want the uh, students to do. And you can identify things like, these are little stars, assessment points, and, and, and other things we can do in there. So really since the pandemic, pandemic we've mostly done this online. Uh, we've done it using Jamboard, am I allowed to say that? Google product? Because um, it's really good. But can you people have used uh, Miro and Mural and, and Padlet and Excel and Word, you know, all sorts of different things, using the same kind of principles. Just depends what, um, you know, what you're comfortable with. We quite like the kind of visual style, though, uh, of, uh, of Jamboard. So that, that's what we do. And, um, uh, and just one last bit for me is, so if you think about this, it's sort of like, just, we're just trying to design the learner journey. So, okay, so you're not going to get, in my view, you're not going to get a great Moodle course unless you know what the learner journey is. So this is the first stage, okay? The second stage is, well, what technology? In our case, mostly Moodle, what are we going to do in order to en enable that journey and to support that journey, to make that really happen? So we've got a number of tools we did, we've developed uh, as part of ABC, this kind of checklist that was nicked off some colleagues in Belgium who did that one, that's quite nice. Uh, we've got this tool wheel or app wheel where you've got Moodle activities in there mapped against the, um, against the various learning types. And we've got this pretty horrible looking uh, table, this is what we did during the pandemic. Again, just to help people think about, as you're going towards the technology, what is your pedagogic rationale? So these are kind of okay, but they're a bit clumsy. Unfortunately, at this point, Rich has now stepped in with a fantastic idea, which is going to show us. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is why I joined UCL and um, chat with Clive and Ross and... Um, I've been working on um, this thing, the app methodology, as I call it. Um, oh, excuse me, the alignment of pedagogy and technology. So, um, pretty straightforward why I use the word apps there. You know, obviously, it's got a, it is an acronym. But at the same time, I like the word apt. I mean, it is a, a word in English, at least. It's a, you know, short for appropriate. 
as an ally. I use the example there of the, of the wine and cheese, because it, for me, you know, we, we kind of know this, this stuff. You, if you, you know, like your, your Stilton, then, you know, you might have a glass of port with it, you know. I think that's a kind of a right, the right kind of thing to have it. If you like your goat's cheese, maybe you like a sweet white. Um, I mean, these things aren't rules, are they? They're not regulations. You don't have to have a wine with a particular cheese. Um, but there's, we kind of know these things are more appropriate. There's something, there's a match. They kind of go together. So that's what this, this thing is supposed to do. And it was a product of my doctoral research I was doing in, the, in this field. I was actually working originally on authentic assessment. Um, and we did a long project with the GISC. Uh, they're a, a funding body in the UK. At least they used to be a funding body, and they're just a body. Um, but, yes, yeah, so they give us a lot of money to invest in authentic assessment. And we were faced with a challenge there to sort of have, work out how to build technologies to support authentic assessment, because that's a tricky thing to do as well. Um, so the methodology came out of that. And this is what it kind of tries to do find out which technology is most apt. It's a semi-rigorous kind of blend. It's a kind of mixed methods approach. So it's a bit qualitative, it's a bit quantitative, it's more rigorous than kind of other techniques that I've seen out there so far. Um, but it relies on this definition of affordance. Now, I mean, that was basically the main subject of what I was working on, affordance theory. And I know affordance has had a rocky ground in, in many um, disciplines. It's been adopted by lots of people. I mean, this is, if you don't know affordance, I'm sure many of you probably do. I won't ask you to raise hands, because I think most people, I expect, know the word affordance. Uh, it's big in ed tech, let's face it. Um, but that's Gibson's original thing, which I have no problem with. I think Gibson was brilliant. I've become a huge fan since I've been studying him for like 10 years. Um, I think I've read everything he ever wrote. Uh, but I think you know, have to, a lot of people kind of, affordance has been corrupted in some days by multiple uptake in different disciplines. And it's lost this connection that it, it lives in space, it lives between people and the world. I think too often people apply affordance to objects to, on the right there rather than where it properly sits uh, in the middle. It's about context and it's about need. I mean, need is massively critical of affordance because we have different needs depending on. Uh, where we are in space. So in a chair is always a classic example. If I'm tired and I might need to rest, I can sit down on a chair. But if I want to reach something on a high shelf, I can use a chair as a stool. Completely different affordance, same object, different needs. So that's a, an easy way of demonstrating it, the link. So I kind of redefine the affordance in my work as what I want to refer to as transaction possibilities. Now, I know this is a bit of a mad slide. I'll try and explain it. Um, so you've got my little character staring into space, staring into time, um, is what the idea is. And often, you know, Fawns is described as this action possibilities um, thing on the left, which I think is massively simplistic. And it, it's, it seals a Fawns as just what you can, how you could act in a moment. It seals it in a moment in time. It isn't very helpful. Um, then you've got the HCI approach, human chromatory human interaction. I used to do a lot of this. Um, so I'm very familiar with how they use the word. And they are interested in the word as interaction. Because they want to know how something can be turned, how something can be twisted, shoved, pulled, you know, how a scroll bar moves up and down. That's their focus. So they're worried about this interaction. But my argument is what we're really interested in here is transaction. As educators, what we're interested in is change. And people have used that word quite a lot over the past few days here and there. We're interested in, in what will change when I use something. So we're looking into the future and are conscious of something we'll get back from an interaction, i.e. this idea of transaction. You know, I think this word was close to Dewey's heart. In his last paper he wrote, he had a trilogy of action, interaction, and transaction. From his perspective, transaction was the ultimate you know, thing we were trying to work towards. Um, so and I think I say the conversational framework is all about this idea of transaction, about how things transact between individuals and the environment. So that's this new idea of affordance, which powers behind the app methodology. So the idea is it's threefold, really. It's quite simplistic. Um, you basically choose a theoretical framework. When we were working on authentic assessment, we designed our own six-dimensional mode of authentic assessment. I've done this for secondary schools as well in the UK, and for that, we used the teaching standards from the UK government, which every teacher has to comply to. So that was another framework. Um, but here, for UCL, we're using, obviously, the conversational framework. It fits into ABC. It's very well-researched, very robust. And what, you, what, I, what you have to do is you have to kind of try and summarize the transaction possibilities using 10 keywords in each case. Um, and then you can effectively rate. So now we've, we've got this blend of quantitative and qualitative, and we can actually rate technologies based on a, on a theoretical framework of how effective they will be to support each one of these learning types. And what you end up with 
is that, <laughs> which I know is yet another nasty spreadsheet, um, which isn't what you were supposed to use, but this is the product um, behind the scenes, as it were. This is my matrices. On the left, I know you won't be able to see it, or I've got all the activities and resources from Moodle. I should say, this is from UCL um, perspective. We don't have big blue button in there, for example, and it's the key ones we use at UCL. And on the top, you've got the learning, the learning types, and each one has got 10 keywords. So we've got Say you take inquiring, I've got things like explore, interpret, investigate. You're picking keywords that describe the transaction possibilities of that learning type. And it, it's quite a hard thing to do this. I mean, I pour through the books, I look at work from people at Clive and others to try and summarize, just in these action verbs almost, the things this thing provides or furnishes from an affordance perspective. And you think they're all quite similar, you know, collect, collate, and things, but actually, they're really not. You know, if I'm just collecting something, I'm just like gathering or putting it in a, in a pot. Um, but if I'm collating something, there's, there's a subtly more element in that. I'm actually making some kind of distinction as I collect to say this lives here and this lives here. And so, you know, these words may sound simplistic and the same, but actually when you try and do this with yourself, you sit down and do it, it's kind of hard to actually rate each one in this case. Um, but you do get this powerful spreadsheet eventually. Then you get these. So this is the idea of the tech trumps. Because as you've seen from what Clive has said, um, the, the ABC approach is very hands-on. It's a workshop. You're trying to do things together in a room and shuffling a learning design into place and then trying to fold in um, tech trumps. So I'll actually, I mean, you can have them as physical cards. I've got a few packs I printed at home. Um, which everyone wants to come and grab you later. You can have a look at what it looks like in physical form. Uh, and, of course, they, they summarize the affordances of each one of these Moodle activities and resources in the context of the conversational framework and the ABC learning design method. Now, if this fires up a browser, it might launch a website. And, of course, we can have them digitally as well. We, this is the first time we've talked about this. Live and I have only been working this the past few months. Um, and then you've got, oh, this isn't touch sensitive, is it? No. no. So you can imagine, you can scroll down and browse them on on web. You can hover over these and get a bit more detail on the various things they are. And you can also click on any of these buttons to kind of get a summary of the ones that are just more powerful for each one of these learning types in, in turn. So that's what it is. Before I finish, I just wanted to, one more thing we realized as we were doing this, as we were running through this process, was what it revealed about these activities and resources and about Moodle. Um, so if you look at the really strong contenders, the ones who come across really strongly in all the learning types, H5P, well, that's probably actually because H5P is lots of different activities within it. So it's actually, I probably need to expand that and rate each one individually. That's probably why it gets such a high score. But the wiki, actually, you know, think about it. The wiki can do loads. It's great for discussing. It's great for production, good for collaboration. It's a really strong part, maybe, you know, a bit underused. Um, but maybe a bit, you know, it's complicated, but it has massively powerful from this perspective. Similarly, perhaps the weaknesses, and this has been talked about in stuff I've been today and maybe elsewhere. I didn't intend it to reveal any weaknesses within Moodle. I just ran my process, and this is what it said. Uh, well, perhaps not that surprising that we know Moodle is not particularly strong on collaboration and practicing. You know, the weakest one is the collaboration area. I mean, we use Zoom and Teams pretty much at UCL to collaborate. We wouldn't be thinking of using it there. But I was curious if this threw out this kind of uh, result. And finally, um, databases. They came out 10 on production, which I was surprised to see as well. But I was pleasantly surprised um, because I know my chemists use them massively for formative assessment. They, they've been doing lots of um, science experiments at home, so they've been doing cooking, basically, in COVID, and getting the students to send results in and share all their data into massive data sets, hundreds of students, hundreds of data sets, and they've been sharing and learning from each other using the database as a formative assessment tool. So it was kind of nice to see this confirmed here that this is a direct tool for assessment in terms of using database. Okay, that's it from us. Um, like I say, we're just started working on this. We're interested if anyone else is using ABC and whether they'd like to kind of work with us on, on this. Um, there's some links there to some of the key resources we talked about today. Um, well, next steps for us, we're going to be expanding this, because at the moment this is Moodle tools, we're going to fold in here Zoom and Teams and Office and portfolios and all the rest of the stuff we do, and then hopefully extend it to UCL as a, a learning tool. So, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Richard and Clive. That was really interesting. And um, we will open up for questions. 
Uh, if anybody has a question, yes. D did I see someone? No. I, I actually was interested in understanding what happens from here. So how long does it take educators, once you've done this collaborative work, you know, do they quickly adopt? I can imagine for them there's quite a lot of time investment in redesigning their courses or rebuilding them. There's been a big change. Oh, sorry, there's been a big change in UCL that we've got people like Rich who are working in the faculties with our academics. So what we try to do now is when we do this design process, is we're trying to bring, uh, try to bring one of the rich type people along, uh, so they can kind of look after the development side as they go through the, uh, you know, redesign or design their courses. Um, but we still need that kind of tool set that Rich has got because a lot of our academics do it themselves. I mean, there's only a small number of actual, uh, you know, program developers. So, but for us, I mean, from my perspective, anyway, the important thing is to get them, uh, help our colleagues to really redesign and design the courses, think about that kind of pedagogical journey. And from that, we can use uh, various types of tools and, and approaches. Uh, thank you very much. We had the pleasure to discuss yesterday a bit as well, so I was really looking forward to this. I'm Ioana from UNESCO IAP. I'm a learning designer and I, we have been practicing the ABC learning design with our colleagues for, I think, four years now? Five? Four? Yeah. And we've taken it further because for us development is also important, so to shorten things. Um, for me, the question is uh, one, which maybe I will uh, reach out and find out about more about how you came up with the numbers per, like, yeah, how did you <laughs> make that happen? Also, because what I notice as a designer that, and sometimes we use the methodology and everything, the implementation is very different because uh, we discuss about the activities and then how you write the instruction, how you use the activity, and I've seen so many variations within a discussion forum, for example, that uh, the way um, a teacher does it can reach a certain level because the question has like blah, 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 and then another one does it, and it's an amazing collaborative space and they use it for production even. So to me, it's not necessarily the tool, but it's also like the, the design and the pedagogy behind and how you will implement it that makes a huge difference. So I've seen, for example, the forum being used for production for collaboration, and I have seen it used only for retention. So my question is like, did this affect your scaling? Did you take everything into account? Like how much, anyway, it's, yeah, I know, maybe a complicated question. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, it's all very important and very challenging questions. Yeah, the, the rating, the numbering is hard, I say. When I'm doing it, um, trying to do it collaboratively, to have more eyes on, on it so you can, you, to really think, you, you have to know Moodle very well, you have to know your context very well, so you have to know exactly what a discussion forum can provide, because there's so many details and so many things you can change in it to decide whether or not it provides some of those keyword things is hard, but it just takes time and, and thought, to be honest. But to answer your second question, I think what this highlights more than anything to me, especially when I was doing a secondary education, it was the last big one I did of this, um, was you, it produces more than one card. So when you were looking, using the cards together, I have 52 cards in the education pack for secondary school teachers. Um, and then something clicks within them. It's the idea of need. Once you've been through the learning design process, you're primed to spot what's going to be useful to you. And then, you, yeah, you might see that and say, oh, that's the one for me. And someone else will say, oh, no, that, that's the one for me. And that's brilliant, and because that's what we're trying to get to, isn't it? We're trying to get to that point of uh, suddenly that light bulb moment. And I think that's the power of, of this. It, it kind of chains you up, said that down that thought process, so at the right, at the right moment, you're primed with the right possibility from one of these apps. Because I often find, when I've done it before with teachers, that they'll see something they vaguely heard. They haven't heard of maybe WhatsApp, but they might have been using Messenger, or vice versa. And they suddenly see how it would be useful in their context to have that prime plugged in at the right point, if that makes sense. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Hi, my name is Bruno Poludar from University of Montreal. I'm the head of the Teaching and Learning Center. We've been using uh, ABCLD uh, for during the pandemic. Uh, we have been developing, uh, well, two entries like uh, Excel sheets in order to guide the uh, technology called Choices. I find your work amazing. But my question is this. Uh, we have teams, we have other integration, and our teachers use a lot of external tools as well as Moodle. So how feasible would you see that you could use your methodology to grade tools that integrate with Moodle as well as external tools? 
Yeah, well, it, we can certainly work with um, um, other tools, as you say. I mean, the tool wheels that Ty's been working on, they're already there. But, yeah, we, it's because the methodology is quite firm in terms of those, those, num those characteristics, the key words that describe the, the third learning theory, the dimensions of learning theory, and then you, it's quite easy to go and rate nothing else and add it to your pile. I mean, the teacher's pack is mostly third-party apps, for example, because teaching education is much more you know, loose. We've got Ed Puzzle in there and all sorts of weird things. Uh, mm. Just to, uh, just to add to that, um, the, you saw an earlier slide, the tool wheel, that's sort of like all the kind of apps. Now, we've got huge versions of that by every app you could ever want. But actually, the more, more useful ones is what's relevant for your particular institution. What do you support? And in the app wheel, um, it's so that the core things are things which are supported well within the university. And then there's things out there which, you know, you might use maybe Menti or something. You might use it, might use it not. Um, so I think that's important. It's so, sort of like, can it, it's almost kind of re restricting a bit, if you like, the choice and say, these are the things we really support. If you want to go crazy and do some really interesting thing, you've found exactly, you say, some kind of new app or something you want to use, that's fine. But we can't really support you very far in that. We'll be interested in your experience, but we can't help you. So I think it's, it's, it's sort of like aligning it up to what's available within your uh, institution. 